change your view graphs. Uh, yes, I think yes. right. And if you would like to um, take the microphone out and hold it in your hand, that is okay too. Yeah. Oh, you think you unplugged the wrong thing. Uh, you unplugged the wrong plug. <laughs> no, you unplugged the projector. That's why you sabotage. We don't need to see what Chris has to say. <laughs> no, no, the projector. Uh. Now it's going to take a while to warm up again, I think. Uh, you have to hit it twice, I think, yes. There you go, it's on. Now it's if it's just a five. button on here, I can press it. Okay. Well, first of all, we have to get it to come back. You can press it so it'll start. I hear it. It just came on. And you're going to be pressing the space bar to change the okay. slide each time? Uh, it's, I don't know. We'll see. I have to run back and forth yes. here to get this thing working. I don't know yet what I'm... We're just trying to figure out the process here at this point. I'm going to do something. I did. That's okay. It's blinking. Just leave it. Okay. It's probably got a startup sequence it has to go through. There it comes. It's kind of green. It'll probably warm up. I'll steal a little bit of extra time while it's uh, <coughs> coming up. Uh, this is uh, my third uh, R&D report in some recent years on Super Rocks. Um, the first two uh, reports develop some new methods to understand how Super Rocks bend and therefore fail if they go fast enough. And the results of the first two uh, reports were summarized in a report, which I'm sure all of you read in a recent uh, issue of uh, Sport Rock. Uh, so this is new work that uh, builds beyond that. Uh, next one. Uh, what we're going to talk about is just a quick review of how flex rock works, how it looks at flexible rockets rather than just uh, rigid rockets. Uh, I'll talk about a new computer program that was developed to do the optimization. I'll talk about some body tube testing in order to get the right input data for the program. Uh, talk about a using program to come up with optimum designs uh, focused on deep super rock because I'd like to win that event tomorrow, if I can. <laughs> uh, and talk about some uh, flight tests that I've done, uh, a couple of unexpected results, and then we'll wrap up with some summary and recommendations. Next. Uh, in terms of what's important for flexible rockets, it's the uh, second and third modes. The first uh, one mode is where the rocket is kind of uh, just rotating at, at the rigid body. Then the other is where you start flexing the body. And when the aerodynamics are such that they'll generate forces enough where you'll flex the body and actually cause it to bend or interact with the other modes, uh, that's where you can get failure. Uh, in particular, if you look at how the modes change with velocity, the uh, rigid body rotation mode here uh, starts bending eventually at higher velocities until it uh, comes back to zero. If you get a situation where uh, that zero velocity is within your flight envelope, your rocket will buckle, and uh, that's what we're trying to avoid here. Uh, so the, uh, the real rationale behind this, pro this particular R&D project is to say that the existing tools, the FlexRock program, uh, which is available to anybody, it's available for free, download off contest rock right now, but it looks at only a particular design so the thought was, well, why don't we couple that with a built-in uh, trajectory program and some optimization algorithms so it can look at a wide variety of designs and see if we can come up with more optimum designs, uh, again, focused in this case on the super rock, but it's applicable to uh, any size uh, model. Uh, the technical approach is shown here, and I'm just going to dive right in. Next slide. Uh, in terms of the program itself, I took the existing FlexRock program, uh, added to it a standard trajectory solver. Um, it's similar to the trajectory calculations that are done in things like RockSim or other programs. It includes the major effects like thrust versus time, uh, drag from skin friction and base drag, and gravity, so that's uh, most of the things you need to consider. It also includes the air elastic part from the FlexRock program, so it does account for how the aerodynamic forces or the effect of stiffness uh, greatly increases as the rocket goes faster and faster. And finally, it has an optimization module uh, for design variables. Uh, you can change the diameter of the rocket, you can change the wall thickness, you can adjust or have a variable thin span, and the optimization code will look at whatever design variables you provide and see which 
ones work best. Uh, the objective is to try to increase the superox core, if that makes sense, uh, as much as possible, but without running into that uh, failure velocity. Next turn. To support the program, the first thing you know, need to know is how heavy is this tube, which everybody probably knows, but also how stiff is this tube. Uh, that's not published data. So I had to go through a fairly long uh, set of tubes, uh, testing uh, 23 different configurations, focused primarily on paper tubes. Not, uh, I did a little bit of additional stuff looking at uh, black shaft uh, tubing, which is very hard to find anymore. I uh, also did one test on a fiberglass tube. These are great tubes, but they kind of run into the gray area of what's allowed in Super Rock, what's not allowed in Super Rock. So uh, this program, our uh, R&D project, really focused on uh, standard paper tubes. I looked at both uh, standard tubes like uh, T20, T5s, the oversized tubes, which are the ones that kind of slip over a standard tube, and then in the case of this guy here, which I'll pass out, uh, you can pass that around. Uh, that's a double wall construction where there's a standard tube bonded inside of an oversized tube. So it's very stiff and pretty strong. That's Once you've got that data, it turns out that there's two ways to summarize the results. One is looking at the stiffness, which is in the top chart. And basically what that chart says is that little tubes aren't very stiff, big tubes are stiff. Voila, <clears throat> not too radical right there. Uh, the chart on the bottom also talks about mass. What you'd like to have is a tube uh, which gives you a lot of length, but not very much weight. So of course that tends to favor very small diameter. So it's sort of intuitive that the optimum sizing will be some balance between big tubes in some areas and maybe small tubes in other areas. And the optimization program helps to go that. All right, here's the optimization program at work. Uh, what I've got here is a model that's going to be configured for an SDC-12. I elected to build this in three sections based on some other results that tended to show that paper designs are a lot more efficient than like an all BT-52 or something like that. So I've got a, a BT-50 in the back, a T-20 in the center, and the front end is sort of a spike of uh, a double wall T-2 plus the T-2 plus uh, tubing. The optimization program works as shown here. I pick some initial size for iteration one or the baseline. It will go through and run and say which tubes work best. And what you'll see is that uh, tube lengths will tend to grow or potentially shrink. But generally you want to start small and kind of grow your way up. It will proceed uh, in what it considers to be the optimum design until you hit an inflection point. That inflection point is when the overall length of the model hit 370. So that's why it really bumps up against that limit. There's no uh, room for further length growth. So basically the optimization is done at that point. So this tells me what the optimum length would be for this configuration. If I had a four segment design or two segment design, it would be different results, but I can analyze that in the program now. Next. Uh, this is a similar but different design. This is for an Aerotech D10. Uh, D10s are nice because they're only 18 millimeters or very light motor. Uh, you can build an 18 millimeter size tube, you got less skin friction drag. This is obviously a better design, right? Maybe, maybe not. Because one problem with the D10 model is it will go very fast. And therefore, the aerodynamic forces will get big. It'll tend to make the rocket buckle a lot. I'll show you a picture of that. Uh, but this is an example using the double wall construction. And that was sufficient to uh, get an optimum design. And if you could flip back to the what button? And now flip forward again. If you look at the Super Rock score in the lower right hand, it says that D10s are potentially a lot better than a D12. So again, you can analyze these sorts of things with program. Next. I can analyze a lot of things with program, but is the program any good? Uh, so I did uh, two uh, different designs to do validation of the program to see how well analysis and reality matched up. This is a configuration for a D12, and the lights were uh, based on what the program suggested. Uh, built the model, flew the model, and the two major things, one is it did fly successfully, did not buckle or kink, and the flight uh, measurement uh, with an altimeter, it said 244 meters, Prediction was 264, so it wasn't quite as high, but uh, you know, I'm 
within 10%, actually 8%, so that's not too bad. Two minutes. Next. Uh, these are some in-flight photographs. Uh, you can see on the far left that the rocket's ascending very uh, nicely. And these cool photographs by Mark McReynolds shows here's the vehicle at different flight times. One very important thing about super rocks is basically if you can get to burnout, you're done. Uh, because at that point, the rocket starts slowing down, so you're home free of that. Getting to burnout is the challenge. Uh, here's the second model. This is a D10 model. Uh, this is all double wall construction, again, like the program suggested. Uh, lights were, again, uh, as suggested by the program. Uh, rocket launch, rocket flew. Um, and here the altitude was within 4% of predictions. So it says that uh, the program working pretty good, or appears to be. Next. And here's one other example. Uh, I've been working with Tim Van Milligan and some other folks here in the uh, Colorado area looking at some these super rocks. Um, they've flown this event at several different contests. Uh, one of the uh, illustrated uh, fun cases is by Ron Coffey where he was flying a D-10 on some fairly flexible structures. Uh, they buckled and flex rocks said, yeah, sure enough, they should have. So again, it's a case of uh, predicting success Success happens, predicting failure, failure happens. So the program's got a pretty good bag of energy. Uh, a couple of weird tidbits, and I'll go through these very quickly. Uh, it appears that adding nose weight may improve the uh, failure speed of some designs. Uh, this is the case where adding just 10 grams of nose weight increases the failure velocity by 20 meters per second. Totally unexpected. I don't totally understand the result, but it's very curious and certainly would be worthy of further study. Uh, next. Uh, the other is a couple of uh, D10 designs. In one case, I've got fins located way at the bottom, like everybody does. Uh, the other case was sort of a configuration suggested by a model by uh, Joffrey back there, where the fins are located a little bit farther forward. The overall altitude doesn't change, but the margin of safety improved substantially. And partially that's because if you think about that bending shape, that I get a lot of amplitude at the base, less amplitude as I go forward. So moving the fins towards that node or deflection point on that bending mode may improve the behavior of some design. Again, something worthy of more study. So this is the results. Um, successfully developed the program, did a lot of testing, some flight tests that seem to uh, do a good job of saying that the program is pretty reasonable. And there are some new techniques for uh, further study and people are interested in looking at. Thank you. Questions? So it's surprisingly, I wanted to build a super rock tonight in my room. Really? What should I be building? Uh, it really depends on what motor you want to use. D8. The what? D8. D10. No, D10. Oh, detail. Yeah. Uh, you want to use that double wall construction, um, and I just saw some links up there that I would recommend. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, if you were using like the reloads, there's like a D7 or a D8. Uh, those actually are fairly low thrust versus time curve, so you might actually be able to get by with something lighter construction than that. But I haven't looked at it. Actually, because you anticipated my question, so I'll, I'll throw it to Joyce and we can have time for uh, on page five of your my presentation, you have a list of assumptions and limitations of your program. An extensive list, yes. And I wondered which of those was maybe the most significant thing that you've left out that might change the result, and also which would you go after uh, trying, which could you take out if you wanted to extend this program and make it and do better. So that's going to be two different questions. It's easier to extend it. The well, I, I would say that the, the biggest concern I would have is joints. Uh, anytime that you've got uh, like a shoulder and it's going to eject and the parachute comes out, uh, you can make a fairly tight fitting joint, uh, very little slop, but maybe the parachute doesn't come out. You can make a very loose joint, but then all of a sudden you've got some unaccounted for flexibility. So anything to look further at the effect of, well, is the uh, joint or coupler tolerances are those significant or not? Early work for Right. Do you think you could extend the program to take some of that into account if you wanted to? Potentially. One of the really nasty parts about that is if the joint is actually 
sort of, uh, you know, I assume it's stiff here, then it's got kind of a dead band, and then it gets stiff again. Now you've got a nonlinear problem, and all of the program to date, uh, except for some very limited stuff very early on, but all the current program uh, assumes a linear uh, stiffness. So any nonlinear problem would be another order of magnitude harder than what's being done right now. Thank you. Um, does the audience have questions? Um, my original question was about testing for failure, yes. and you did that. My question is, how close? How close is the that's, accuracy and probability? That's an excellent question, because one of the uh, things about um, even flutter or error elastic analysis in professionals is how much margin is prudent uh, in the, if you're building like a jetliner or a military fighter, the standard requirement is you have to have a 15% margin between what you think is your failure speed versus what's the maximum speed you're ever going to go. Uh, so that seems to be prudent, but it's kind of like the Barrowman method. Everybody uses one caliber stability. Where'd that come from? Why not half caliber? Why not three calibers? So uh, it's a very that's a very good question about well, how much margin is prudent. I've been sort of aiming to 10 to 15 percent. Unless, or less interested in the margin you want for your model and how accurate the margin of the program was, meaning program. how big of a difference between success and failure on the program and your test model. Uh, once you start getting into this, you find out that there are so many variables, like how, how stiff is this body tube versus this one versus this one, uh, how good's your construction, I'm not accounting for fin mounting flexibility. So there's a number of things where it would be prudent uh, to consider that I want some elbow room to account for these potential uncertainties. And again, the 10 to 15% seems reasonable. I haven't intentionally flown models that are like 5% or 2%, uh, but that would be very interesting stuff to look at. Thank you. Okay, one more time? Okay. Oh, I All right. I guess I'm done. Yes, you're done. All right. Thank you. Thank you.